today is the feast of St. Francis of Assisi, one of my personal favorite and, and heroes. Uh, so rather than using a collect from the book, uh, I should show this here. This is Lesser Feast of Bass. So the church has, uh, okay, I'm going to get myself behind before I even start, but in addition, to, in addition to the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, there are two other sets of books that the church has, which you might often see, occasionally see, in the site in the Sunday Sunday bulletin. One is called the Book of Occasional Services, uh, which is services, public services that we do uh, that are not often celebrated. The, the one probably people are most familiar with is the Advent Service of Blessings and Carols, uh, the All Hallows Eve service is in there, Blessing of the House is in there, uh, there are a whole, whole slew of things, including uh, when we've talked about baptism, there's a whole series of prayers and Blessings for people who are pursuing uh, baptism, uh, the catechumen that we talked about a couple weeks ago. So that's all in the Book of Occasional Services, which technically hasn't been updated since 2003, although they've supplemented it. Then the other, the other book uh, that supplement, the Fishing self this book, is called Lesser Feasts and Fasts. Uh, this is the most recent edition. Uh, They were thinking about making some changes. There might be a new one coming out. It'll be 2021, but it hasn't come yet. Uh, but what this is essentially is all of those extra saint days. So that there are maybe two dozen saints listed in here, all the evangelists, St. John, the, the Baptist, all that, as well as the big days like all saints and things. Here uh, in this book is, again, we'll talk more about this in the liturgical calendar in about a few weeks, but for most every day and most every month of the year are these optional uh, are these optional feasts or commemorations. Uh, so just to give you a feel for October, the first was Remigius, Bishop of Rims, who uh, baptized Clovis and changed kind of uh, the church history, and Teresa of Lisieux, uh, John Raleigh Mott, uh, who was a 21st, 20th century uh, ecumenical activist in the church, and then today St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, so if you come on Wednesdays and you often wonder where these odd saints are that we're that we're lifting up, they come out of this book. Uh, and they're for, on the calendar. And they're on the calendar, and you all get these calendars to, to take home with you and look at for, for next time. But so, and for each day, uh, there's a little history of what the what, what the person is known for, why they're commemorated in the church, and then a collect and readings that you can use. They're designed to be used in a Eucharist, but you can. So I thought today we'd start with the collect for the, for the day of St. Francis of Assisi. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Most high, omnipotent, good Lord, grant your people grace to renounce gladly the vanities of this world, that following the way of blessed Francis, we may, for love of you, delight in your whole creation, with perfectness of joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So last time we marched our way through the uh, Holy Eucharist, and we got as far, basically, as the peace, at least according to my notes. So today we'll, we'll go through the second half. That was the, the Liturgy of the Word, from the entrance rite, College of the day, the lessons, the sermon, the creed, the prayers of the people, uh, confession, and uh, exchange of the peace. So today we'll pick up the, the back half of that service, which is the Holy Communion. Um, our Book of Common Prayer uses the most, I said last week there are several different, many, many different names that we have for this. Uh, the, our book happens to use one of the most ancient, which is the Great Thanksgiving. The Eucharistic prayer is the Great Thanksgiving. Give thanks all the time, but the, but the prayer of Thanksgiving we say at the altar every Sunday is the is the great Thanksgiving. Um, and there are lots of different. Uh, I use this funny word valence. Uh, uh, last time I don't know if there's really an English word or not, but I like it. Uh, so many different valence, many different directions or energies that that the great Thanksgiving has. One is giving thanks to God for all that God has done, just particularly through Christ in creation, you know, that, that God has acted and sent Christ to us and saved us. 
Another is the mystery of Christ's presence in the bread and wine. Maybe mystery not so much in the sense of a riddle or a Sherlock Holmes thing to be figured out, but I think it's important for us to say we oh, we talked about this last time. We don't really know how Christ is in the bread and wine. We just know that, right? And we and we revel in that. But the mystery that that God literally condescends to us every Sunday, every time we say the Eucharist, uh, and, and it exists in the bread and the wine. Then the meal as a nourishment of, of, as of us, yes, individually, but also as a, 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 a gathering around the table as a community of Christ. And then again, we touched on this a little before, but the one I love the most, I think, is the anticipation of the heavenly banquet. That what we do here on Sundays is the slightest, smallest taste and hint of what heaven may actually be like. Uh, with, with a lot more better things that we can't even imagine. But the, there's a kernel of, of heaven at the corporate moment for us. So at heart, this really is a simple common meal. Um, and I don't remember why I said this last time, so if I'm repeating myself. Uh, we, I know we talked last time that how the early, early church actually had a full meal. They, they came and brought platters of food and, and shared you know, meat and vegetables and wine and all this sort of stuff. That went away relatively quickly. But what we believe is these, these little tastes, this, this little wafer, a little sip of wine, whatever it is, um, you know, in that in that small portion is the full abundance of Christ's grace. That, that the meal uh, doesn't depend on volume. You know, Christ's grace isn't dependent on the volume of what we partake of. It's, it's that way that we're partaking of. So in the 1940s, yeah, 40, late early 1940s, a British uh, Episcopal priest, who was also a Dublin at Oxford, named uh, Gregory Dix, was very famously said, he was a liturgical scholar, and he said, the shape of the Eucharist is to offer, to, or to take, but I'll be going back, to offer, to bless, to break, and to give. So, And that's sort of the, I'll, I'm going to confound that a little, a little bit at the end of this, but, but that is sort of the overall shape of the, the, the Holy Communion part of the Eucharist. In the offering, uh, some churches, and I think you all used to, and maybe we can bring it back at some point, but some churches used to literally bring the bread and wine up from the back. We do bring our, our newer liturgical theology, and what that was based on historically was that for some rural parishes in the middle of nowhere where people didn't have two tents to rub together. A loaf of bread and a jug of wine that somebody had to provide was may have been a real sacrifice, right? You may have you may not have eaten as much the day before because the bread had to go to the church that Sunday. Um, we don't live in a culture where bringing bread and wine anymore are really sacrifices. What we tend to think of more liturgically is the offering of monetary gifts uh, that, that we bring forward. Um, but there is this idea of offering. We make an offering to God. Then what has been offered to gather, the, primarily the bread and wine, is blessed. Is we, we invoke the Holy Spirit upon it, and it becomes, we talked about, through the real presence, it becomes the body and the blood of Jesus in ways that we don't profess to know. We break those, and there's a, there's a twofold element to that. We we. We break at the, at the fraction, both to commemorate Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, and that's why I think you know, it's important that we hear the sound. Uh, it's one of the few reasons that a wafer might be better than an actual loaf of bread. I think eating a loaf of bread is somehow more substantial to me, but you can't crack a loaf of bread. So, so, we, we have to, yeah, so we celebrate the actual sacrifice, but we also, it's the, it is the breaking of the bread. It is the... Um, the sharing out of the gift of Christ to the entire to the entire community, kind of like when you have a nice big loaf of bread on the table that's great to look at, but it's even better when you start to slice it and give it to everybody so that everybody can partake of it. So, offering, blessing, breaking, and then giving, distributing, distributing the distributing the elements, uh, the consecrated elements to to the people, uh, so that they might they might partake. So one of the uh, 
Other big changes, theologically speaking, in the 1979 prayer book, again bound up in that liturgical movement that we talked about, is the idea that all of that, those four verbs, are actually the action of every single person in the room. The, the medieval understanding that persisted for centuries after the Middle Ages of Eucharist was it was the priest doing this, the people watching. Cranmer, we said, got the people a little bit more involved, but even his theology, uh, and as I said, the theology that persisted on into the 20th century, was really that the priest was doing anything that mattered uh, at, at the altar in Holy Communion. We have now jettisoned that view and, and firmly believe that everybody is there with the assistance of the Holy Spirit to, to, to bless uh, and, break, and break this bread. It's why in most of our Eucharistic prayers, there are things for the people to say. We're using one right now that doesn't, uh, but that's a rarity. It is, it is uh, reinf a reinforcement that all of us, spiritually and sometimes with our lips, are, are blessing this bread and wine uh, and making it, inviting Jesus into, into our presence. Uh, so God, that you may, uh, and it's interesting, I've seen, I won't name the churches, but I, I've looked at the Eucharist at a couple churches, Episcopal churches around here, uh, and also when I've been at diocesan events, and it does seem to be an old holy little verb uh, where the the missile, the missile, the, the, the altar book, and the stand, and the, and the chalice, and the pattern that may be covered stay on the altar all the time, um, and that really is a holdover from this ancient practice of what was called a priest mass, right? The priest, just you've probably seen in movies, the priest comes up, usually with the back, back to the church, and does everything here, uh, and often a loner has just one server, so everything kind of already needs to be on the, on the altar, and kind of mumbles a blessing and things like that. Um, it's not consistent with our current liturgical Eucharistic theology, which is, which is that the altar is the place of all people, uh, and that we all participate in bringing those things on. Uh, let's see, a couple words about blessing. So the blessing really begins in what we call the Sursum Corda, which is lift up your hearts. So that second line of that call and response that we have, uh, you, which, which is an ancient, an ancient uh, set of lines, uh, there's a better word for that, but an ancient set of lines dating probably from the third century. Um, and I love that you know, we're, we're lifting up our hearts to God and we're offering those to God in the offering portion of this of this right, we are offering God our hearts, and we're offering God our thanks, because the next is let us give thanks to the Lord our God in his right to so do. Uh, so again, we hear right at the very, very beginning of the Eucharist this idea of thanksgiving and offering. Thanksgiving and offering. And then we move into the the oh sorry, usually following that is something called a preface, which is in a particular season of the year, uh, sort of a seasonal summation of what God and Jesus have done uh, in the world, uh, that it's right that we give thanks to you for God Almighty, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so there's one for Advent, there's one for Christmas, all that. And then in the ordinary time of year that we're in now, there are just three that we kind of rotate through, one to God the Father, one to Jesus Christ, and one to the Holy Spirit, uh, which just sort of sets uh, reminds us of the season we're in and sets and draws us back to a particular theological angle. Uh, not every Eucharistic prayer has allows for that. Some of them have what is called a set preface, uh, but, the, but there is that uh, that comes right before the, the holy, holy, holy. And then after that sanctus, after that holy, 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 we move into one that we talked about before. Depending on how you count, there are either either four or seven or thirteen and different Eucharistic prayers uh, that we that we can use. Uh, thirteen is a bit of a stretch because some of that is just inclusive language versions of prayers that we already have. So I, I think thirteen is an exaggeration. But we we have essentially seven Eucharistic prayers that we can use in the church. Four are in this book. Um, prayer A, which is the shortest focuses mostly on the cross of Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice for us and the, and the forgiveness of our sins. Most appropriate in Lent, probably also in Advent, at least some of the time. 
B, which is the one we use most of the time, uh, is a prayer that really lifts up God's act throughout history. You know, the creation, uh, word in the prophets, you sent Jesus Christ, you know, all sort of a full summary. It's almost like a little creed uh, saying everything that Jesus has done. Prayer C that we were doing this time last year is that very modern prayer uh, written in the 1970s about this earth, our fragile island home, and how we haven't been the greatest stewards of it, but you, O oh Lord, uh, still make us in charge of it, help us, help us to help creation. And then prayer D, which we usually use on bigger feast days. It's a long prayer. Um, I think I said in response to a question Steve asked last week. It's, a, it's an old, old prayer, fourth century, but it's one that is common across Anglicanism, Catholicism, and the Orthodox tradition. So it's a very uh, uh, ecumenical prayer. Uh, and it was inserted in the book, chosen for the book, specifically because we wanted to have at least one prayer, that we Eucharistic prayer that we pray, that we share with our brothers and sisters in other, in other denominations, because we have a lot more in common with them than, than we don't. And then, as I said, the Enriching Our Worship, which I didn't bring in, but it's a slim volume, has three additional Eucharistic prayers, we're using prayer two for that. I have a question. Sure. Um, did the, uh, did the Episcopal Church require people to fast before communion? It, it, it never has officially. It became, in a whole other series of talks we give, but in, in, in the advent of the Anglo-Catholic movement or the Oxford movement in the middle of the 19th century, a lot of the Roman Catholic uh, traditions that aren't in any book became vogue and fasting uh, on on Sunday before you received, even if you didn't receive until noon, <laughs> was, uh, was, a, was a popular practice. Uh, but it was never a requirement. Okay, so the, and the general outline, so we have those three, four, seven, thirteen prayers that we can use, but the general outline of them is all the same. Again, holy, 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 we're done that part. We, we, we start again by giving thanks to God for acting in creation, including the redemption of the world. We have the words of the institution on the night before he died, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. Uh, so look, those are scriptural paraphrases. Some of them are a little bit of its quotation, but scriptural paraphrases of the Last Supper uh, that we think are very important because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Um, and the element there to think about is it is remembrance. The, the fancy term for it is anamnesis, but it is a remembrance. So we, first we give thanks to God, and then we consciously remember what Jesus has done for us. Uh, and often in that uh, in that a part that the people say, we are remembering, you know, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. It is our act of remembering the, the grace that Jesus has shown us. Then the oblation, which is just a fancy word for offering. We offer to you from your creation this bread and this wine. So we, are, we have physically offered it before, at the altar before we started with any words, but now we are formally and corporately offering it uh, to Jesus as a sacrifice. The Epiclesis that we've talked about before, the coming, the descent of the Holy Spirit and the entry of the Holy Spirit into the bread and the wine. And most of the prayers end on this note of the heavenly banquet. With, that, with all the saints we may join to you with heaven, blah, blah, blah. And always with the doxology, naming the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, which is a traditional way to end prayers of thanksgiving and of joy. So, a section of thanks, a section of remembering what Jesus has done, a section of offering, a section of the Holy Spirit descending, I'll say more about that in a second, and then this heavenly banquet of the doxology. There is, uh, controversy is too strong, there's a difference of opinion, I'll say, liturgically, about when the bread and the wine, not forget about how, but when the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Jesus. Um, the, I think the more common answer and the one that the church recommends certainly more, uh, more widely is it the entire prayer. There is no one moment uh, in the prayer when uh, the, the wine, and the, the bread and the wine become the body and the blood. Others do believe that at the, at the words of institution, do this in remembrance of me, there is some sort of transformation that happens. They can kind of more pinpoint it chronologically. 
Um, I'm actually of two minds on this. Uh, I tend to do just a little bit of a thing at, at those words of remembrance just because they are the words of Jesus and we are, we're reciting them. Uh, but I think the if, if we have an official position on that, and we don't really, but it, it, is, it, is, it is the entire prayer that works the consecration of the bread and the wine. There's no one magic moment uh, when this was bread and it is now the body. Uh, that gets a little too, um, again, medieval for, for, for what we have, what we find in this book. And as I said, the great, both symbolic of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and both a practical but also a beautiful uh, act of preparing preparing this meal to be served to, to everyone who lives there. Um, and then just a note, and I'm sure Roger must have talked about this many <laughs> times, uh, but it's just a little piece of liturgical trivia. Uh, you know, the, the rails that are so important to us, kneeling at the rail in order to, to receive communion. Rails were not common at all um, in either Catholic or Anglican churches until about the 16th century when it was realized that, you know, I don't really know the whole story, but the, the lore is that there were dogs who were coming in and spoiling the altar or, you know, doing whatever. And so rails were set up uh, in order to keep the dogs out of, of, the, of, of, the, of the sacred space. Um, what there was before this, and there, in the pictures of the sanctuary that are hanging out in that hallway, I think there's one picture that this church used to have that was called a ruby screen. So the really old-fashioned way to do this is that the people sat in the nave, and again, they weren't participating in this Eucharist thing. So the people sat out here in the nave, and the liturgy of the Word mostly happened out here. We read the lessons, we had the sermon, we said the prayers. But then when it came time for Holy Communion, the priests disappeared behind the screen that had windows in it. You could see through it, but they were definitely in a different part of the church that you really didn't belong in. Um, and all the magic happened out here at the, at the room screen, uh, behind, the, behind, the, behind the room screen, which was all the more convenient if you weren't going to serve the people anything, because it kind of just, this, this all happened in that room, you elevated, you elevated the consecrated uh, bread and wine uh, so people could see it, and then you put it back down, and they went on with their knitting, and, and you as the priest consumed everything, put it away, and then came out for the benediction. So, um, a lot of these things that we think of as traditional architecture of the church, some of them aren't that old, like rails, and some of them actually served a fairly, oh, they might be beautiful and they might be historical, but they also serve kind of a, an exclusionary purpose uh, that we don't want to, to continue. And I think we lost the screen in this church probably a hundred years ago. I never heard the dog thing, but it kind of fits when you, if, if you've been in uh, churches or cathedrals in Europe where, where uh, like pulpits have these big coverings oh, of yeah. hoods over them. Right. And that was very practical. It was to keep pigeon droppings off the priest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I it was <laughs> and, and even even uh, uh, the pyramids on the on the altar, I mean the uh, like the Paul, I mean all the all oh, yeah. everything that's covering the chalice right. is is to keep, keep the flies, like flies out right. yeah. pigeon droppings and, yeah. and everything. And everything else. Absolutely, yeah. And, and so, right, these things that start for very practical reasons become imbued with this, you know, spiritual lure that we can't do without them. Right. Right. So, the pulpits were kind of late, weren't they? What? The pulpits probably date from the Counter Reformation in the Catholic cathedrals. The, uh, they may. Yeah, you're right. I don't right. think they, they had they... pulpits. Some of them <coughs> after. Nothing. Oh, okay. Could be. Are you saying that it was okay for the dogs to soil on the kneelers? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they weren't, you know. Yeah, exactly. Don't go to roll pants. And the, 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 I, I may have said this to some of you before, but in my in one of my liturgy classes in, in seminary, the, the class where we actually learned how to do these things that we've just been talking about. Uh, my literature professor had a particular thing about the hall, which is this little piece of cardboard covered with silk that you kind of put over the chalice. Um, and he, he thought it was fussy and unnecessary and all that sort of stuff. He said, the only reason you should ever use this is if the fly is buzzing around and you don't want it to get into the water. So I don't know if you remember, my very first Eucharist here was outside. Right? <laughs> and there were two flies buzzing around and I thought, oh! <laughs> and fortunately we had a hall. And there have been a couple of indoors. Not a whole lot of it, yes. Do you have uh, a little spoon up there? 
No, we because we don't intake the spoon is actually draw the if bread falls in uh, is, to, is to sort of draw the bread back out by putting your fingers in it. Since we don't intake, I don't own a spoon, but, but I don't use one. I actually had one time where a fly did get in the wine. Oh. Even even using yeah, the paw. Right. And so my first instinct was to take the spoon and get the fly out. <laughs> Put it in a purificator and then sacrifice it on the altar. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, I don't know if people should really be drinking, you know. Oh. Uh, I did this chalice after the fly was in, so I had an assisting minister with me who, who then took it into the sacristy and brought out new wine, oh, which is then, and fortunately this happened before the, the, yeah. the consecration, so. It, you know, it was all okay, but still it was just... Yeah. Be, just all these practicalities that go on up there that you all don't all see. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what can we do now? Um, and finally, give. So offer, bless, break, and then give. Um, I love... Uh, Cyril was a 4th or 5th century bishop of Jerusalem. We have a lot of his... In another book, we have a lot of his beautiful, beautiful sermons. But I love reading um, his, his take on this, and yeah, it's just, it's just lore, but I love it, is that to receive communion, you make the left hand the throne for the right hand on which God will sit, and I just, when Jesus will sit, and I absolutely love that. There is no right or wrong way to hold your hands, right, so don't worry about that, but it's just an image that the first time I ever heard that, oh, that is just so beautiful, making this a throne for Jesus to come. So, Cyril, Cyril. He's not the same one as Cyril and Methodius? No, that's they're, they're Eastern, right? Yeah, and they're a little before, I think. No, they're a little after. Cyril and Jerusalem, yeah. Um, and then finally, a, just a word about intinction. I don't know if you've ever done dipping the, yeah. dipping the bread into the wine here. So, with COVID, we haven't really we haven't done much about that. Um, again, just a little bit of uh, liturgical trivia. Uh, from what I read, and I, I don't know. But intinction only became popular in the Middle Ages when people began to take the consecrated bread home with them as sort of a superstition. You know, put it under the pillow so the crops would be good, or hold it against your mouth if you have a toothache. And, and the priests didn't want people uh, doing this, so they would dunk it in the wine and give it to you. So you had no choice but to eat it you know, or get it all over you. Uh, so, again, not to say that intinction is bad, it's not a bad one. But again, it, the, it, it is not an ancient practice that has anything to do with Jesus. It's just something that came out for practical reasons. I have to be sensitive to our UCC friends here. Yep. But uh, but my but my understanding is that that grape juice came into into practice um, only in the twentieth uh, century, early twentieth century, with with prohibition. I, I or, or temperance. The, the temperance actually, before that. Yeah. Actually, earlier than that, because yeah. some of my husband's ancestors were. Uh, a congregational, and, and his uh, great great grandfather initiated that back in the 18, I guess, 1840s, oh. or maybe earlier. I think that's the basis of the whole Welch's Grape Juice Company. I always read that really? was started. Really? I, heard it started yeah. I heard it started in um, a Methodist church in California, oh. and, who, and a member of the church was Mr. Welch. <laughs> Welch's <laughs> Grape Juice. Uh, Bonnie, any rebuttal? Or <laughs> it's just that we're so eager to get to it, we don't wait for firm. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's great. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so, so that's that's the Holy Communion proper. The cleanse the table. Post Communion prayer. The one that we use is really from about the fourth century or so. So, and. That's really the that's really the pivot out the door, uh, because if you think about it, we, we give thanks. We the first part of that prayer is giving thanks for all that has just come before, being fed both spiritually in the liturgy of the word and physically and also spiritually in the communion. But then we begin to turn, give us strength and courage. You know, we are we are beginning to turn ourselves out to the world because we talked about. Uh, well, I'll save that for a moment. Uh, but, 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 but what Mass, what Eucharist is really is intended for us to do is to take everything that we've just encountered and experienced and dwelled upon in there and take it out to the world. So that, that prayer is sort of that movement, that turning toward the world.
world. Then a blessing, which technically is not required by the uh, by the Book of Common Prayer, and there was a movement to actually suppress it in the 1979 book. I'm glad they didn't. I, I would say, being used to it, we had one professor at seminary who would never say a blessing at the end of the Eucharist, and it always felt like he was withholding it. It was like, do you not like us? Do you not, you know? So things become customary, and when you don't do them, they, 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 feel, they feel odd. And then the dismissal. Uh, and many of you, I'm sure, know that the word mass comes from ite missa est, go, the mass is ended, uh, which is the last words the people heard in Latin uh, back in the day, uh, and from Misa we get mass, but that, that is the sending out, you know, the, the, what the prayer, of course, many prayers have started, we send, we send out. So what did the word missa mean? Send, it's from send. Yeah, it means, right, it is, like it is, like it is, it is, it is being yeah. sent, it is a passive, it is being sent, the body is being, the body of Christ is being Sent for. And each is just the, the very far to go. And then the recession with the cross is also the Christ leads us as we oh. in, you know, into the world. I had, I had not ever considered that, but it makes tons of sense. You know? Yeah, I always. Yeah, well, that's it. Tori Hobbs can say something. <laughs> I'm coming from heaven. I always refer to going to Mass. What's the. Is there a right, wrong? Just to hold something. Well, no. I mean, so Holy Eucharist is kind of what we've centered on. Holy Baptism and Holy Eucharist are the two, the two big rites. Uh, but the Great Thanksgiving, the Lord's Supper, the Mass. What do you call what we do on that chapter? I'm sorry. What do you like? What do you say you do? Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> to you, I call, I call it the Holy Eucharist. Yeah, okay. My yeah. own tradition is to call it the Mass. Okay. But, but. I, I don't think that's where you all are, so I don't do it. Right, 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 yeah. okay. But yeah. Because I'm kind of the same way. I right. don't know. I'm not lying to say, oh, God, we're men. Right. Yeah. Is that that? And, and, and I know that's sometimes you guys slip, and I'm like, oh. But, but I, I, I have much more confidence than that. Yeah. So the same sort of thing. But, it, but it's all the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Lord's Supper, right? You want to get it right. Yeah, so <laughs> when they're wrong. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons yeah. I like Mass is because it does celebrate the tradition, that, that the idea that we're all doing the same thing. We may have different names for it. But the most ancient name in the West for it is the Mass. I bet. Yes. Well, just a little note about Europe and their usage. Now, in French, the, the Mass is like Mass is Mess, M E S S E. But in German, that, that word also means a fair. A, a fair, like you a, know, like a, a, fair? a trade fair. Oh, or oh a yeah. Country fair or something yeah. like that. Am I right? Oh. And so, um, well, I was going to Catholic churches in. Germany, and they were, would refer to the Mass as a Gottesdienst, which means God's service. Oh, okay. Or a, you know, divine service, I guess you could say, right? Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. In, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, so, you know, linguistic. Oh, right. right. Well, that's why we have all these different names for the same thing. Right. Yeah. Right. You'll notice that, that uh, when I receive communion, I always say, Amen. Which is a Catholic tradition, which an amen this I believe. So when you say the body of Christ, then I'm saying this I believe before I take the bread, and I'm saying that before I take the wine. Most Protestant churches, Episcopal, Lutheran, you know, UCC, all, I mean, don't do that. I thought they did. I thought Lutherans did. No, I mean, um, so I don't know, it, it, the Catholic Church pretty much requires it. Mm. Right. And um, I'm just wondering why our Protestant Church, it, it's a very small thing and I think it really doesn't matter. So for me it's a personal thing. Yeah. I like, I mean I like to say that as a response right. to... Well, oh, right, because what's being handed with you, you're saying, saying says the body of Christ, Christ, you, Christ, you assent to that or express your yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about the history. I know some people, that my experience, some people say thanks to God. Uh, some people don't say anything, and actually the amen in our book is in brackets. It's optional. You don't have to say it. But, uh, yeah, I don't know anything about uh, I don't know. <laughs> Good. So one last thing about the Eucharist, and then I'm going to try to cover the daily office and keep us a little bit on schedule very quickly. Um, so we talked about Gregory Dix's fourfold movement uh, particularly of the, of the Holy Communion part, offer, bless, break, give, or receive. Um, 
another uh, a rubric I like even better because it applies to both half, both halves of the service is to hear, to interpret, or to bring inward, and to respond. Those being a, a, a threefold cycle that we go through in the Eucharist, and we go through it twice. In the liturgy of the Word, we hear the Word, particularly in the, in the lessons. So we hear the Word of God. We interpret or internalize or apply, whatever verb we use, we, we apply that Word through the words of the sermon. What does, you know, these words were written thousands of years ago. What, what, what import, what one import anyway do they have for us today? And then we respond to them. We respond by saying what we believe in the creed. We respond by praying for the world. We respond by confessing our sins. And we respond by passing the peace. So there's, a, there's an arc there of hearing, internalizing, and responding to what we've internalized. And then we repeat it. That we hear the words of the Eucharistic prayer. We, we um, recapitulate, we reflect upon all of God's actions and all of God, Christ's grace. We internalize Christ by consuming the bread and the wine. And we respond by going forth to do Christ's actions in the world. Um, and I just, I, I have, ever since I've learned that, I've just been hung on to that as thinking, uh, it's, it's the best handle I know to sort of say what we do on Sunday mornings again and again and again. We hear, we internalize, we respond. We hear, we internalize, and we respond. Um, and that, that might sound clinical, but I think if we put a spiritual lens on it, it's, uh, I think it's quite good. That was all I was going to say about the Eucharist. So any questions were... Okay. So... The daily office. So I had a whole day set apart for this, and if we, don't, if we don't want this course to drag on to Christmas, I decided what I won't give you, although I'm happy to talk about it anytime with anybody, I'm not going to give you the mechanics of the morning and evening prayer. You can look at them, you can look at them in the book. Um, but I do want to talk about the daily office. I've, I've said before in this class and probably other contexts, um, I think it is both one of the biggest blessings and gifts of Anglicanism that we have this daily office given to us. And I think it is an incredibly spiritual complement to what we do in the Eucharist. The Eucharist we can only do gathered as the body of Christ. We need to have a priest in order to do certain things. Um, and it requires a lot of logistics, right? We can't do that on The daily office you can pray by yourself anywhere. Uh, and you're joining you're joining your prayers and your readings and your, and your thoughts uh, with the thousands, if not millions of people who are doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, so the overarching idea here of morning and evening prayer, there are others, but we'll mostly talk about that, is that prayer isn't, as I said, something we do only on Sundays. Uh, the ancient Jewish tradition was prayers of the hours, that at certain hours of the day, either in the temple or on your own, you paused uh, to pray to God. And there was also a cycle of morning and evening sacrifices at the Temple of Jerusalem. So we had sort of uh, occasional prayers sprinkled throughout the day, and then the two big prayers at morning and evening where there were sac ritual sacrifices uh, at, at, at the altar in, in Jerusalem. We also, so we, that is a tradition we inherit and resonate with. We have Paul's injunction in uh, 1 Thessalonians to pray without ceasing. Uh, not probably literally, but the idea that prayer should never be far from your lips, prayer should never be far from far from your mind. And we see Jesus, importantly, we see Jesus doing that so many times in the Gospels, particularly in the Synoptic Gospels. A paragraph or a new section will start, and Jesus went off to pray. Jesus went off by himself to pray. You know, and Jesus prays in the garden, prays in the wilderness, right? It isn't just sort of narrative detail, but it, I think there's a, a, a bottom for us of, of putting our place, ourselves in the places of prayer. Is it really true that John Wesley prayed every 10 minutes? I read that sometime. I don't know. I, yeah, wow, that's a little hard to get things done, but yeah, so. Um, so then in early Christianity, kind of picking up on these, on these uh, examples of the things that went it became common 
to say a prayer at the third, sixth, and ninth hours of the days, which of the days which generally correspond to not sorry, nine a.m., twelve, twelve noon, and three p.m. Those became dedicated more to the passion of Christ, so that we prayed for Christ hanging on the cross, death. Um, then a midnight prayer, which though as Genesis one starts in the darkness and the swirl and all of that, midnight kind of came the hour to celebrate God and creating. And then the sunrise prayer, which looks in two directions. One, uh, sort of Peter and all the disciples' denial, the cock crows three times at sunrise, but also the resurrection. So the, the hours of the day, of each day, very early came on to have some sort of symbolic or theological or spiritual. So by the fourth century, so sort of bringing this all together, um, the church had added, at least in the cathedrals, which are not the cathedrals we think about today, uh, but it happened whatever whatever little church the person called the bishop happened to be in was the cathedral. They started these cathedral offices, uh, which were uh, I, I have to read this because relatively flashy set of morning and evening prayers. Again, harkening back to the, uh, the Jerusalem prayers, um, and an author I wrote, read said. These have famously been described as reasonably brief, colorful, ceremonious, odiferous, and full of movement. Uh, so, they were, so they were lots of incense, lots of vesture, lots of processing, um, very little scripture. It was mostly set prayers, a couple of psalms, maybe a song, and you were out. And these, these cathedral offices were probably at most about 15 minutes long. Um, in parallel, the monks in the monasteries, both male and female, uh, never together, but uh, were creating the much more expansive and weighty what we call the monastic offices, which emphasize copious reading of scripture, reading the entire Psalter, all 150 Psalms through at least in one week, if not one, two or three times in one week. I mean, can you imagine? With eight or nine services a day, you could probably accomplish that. That's a lot. Uh, to the point where we think a lot of monks in that era, even not literally, had the entire book of Psalms memorized, uh, you know, which is just, you know, to me, incredible. So, again, with this, with the service of hours, they finally came up with this idea of eight services, I think I got that right, eight services throughout the day. So, matins, usually in the middle of the night, again, the 3 a.m. or so, not the middle of the night, 3 a.m., you'd actually rise from your bed. Uh, and, and before sunrise, celebrate God creation. Lauds at sunrise, prime at 6 p.m., at 6 a.m., tears at 9, uh, gnomes at noon, uh, prime tears, sext, sext, sorry, sext at 3 o'clock, and then gnomes, and then uh, vespers and common. So eight services a day in most of these, uh, in most of these monasteries. And if you look at St. Bernard's rule, uh, which is one of the earliest monastic rules, that he expected the monks to be in, uh, in the chapel eight times a day. Didn't they the sing a lot of that? They sang tons of uh, much of it sung. Uh, all, most of the prayers were sung. The Psalter was always sung. There were hymns that they sang. Almost, probably the only thing they didn't chant a lot, except on very special days, was, was the scripture lessons. So, that's this, this sort of, uh, uh, what's the this parallel, parallel organization of, for the laity, these cathedral services, which were very brief and had almost nothing to do with scripture, but they were a way to sort of celebrate the hours, and the monastic services, which were kind of having Sunday school, I would be facetious, but having Sunday school eight times a day. Uh, you know, Cranmer gets this, he, he sees this, and we've talked about this before, uh, he says, there is something so salutary for all Christians to pause at certain times of the day, to praise God, to read scripture, and to pray. Um, and he realizes that the monastic thing is, you know, nobody can do that while you're trying to plow the fields or raise children or whatever. You can't, you can't stop eight times a day to pray. Um, and the cathedral services are too, are too little, uh, are not enough. So he kind of boils all that tradition down to, into basically morning prayer and evening prayer. Um, as an aside, our book has a new day prayer in Compline. 
uh, but there were later petitions. Cranmer only had morning prayer. Uh, as I said, a vast uh, simplification, but also a real dream on his part that everybody, everybody could do these. And, and I meant to bring it in. She, uh, Ron found a picture of the, uh, or, yeah, a picture of um, all the art that was on sale at the tag sale of this couple, a man and a woman out in the field with sort of a wheelbarrow half full of, I think they're picking potatoes or something. The church is in the background, and they're pausing and praying. And we said, you can just imagine, they hear the church bell toll, it's time for morning prayer, and so they stop, and they say their prayers with the, with the, with the rest of the church. Yeah, those, you mentioned, um, I don't know how to do this, but there's a wonderful small book called The Music of Silence, mm -hmm. and I'm mentioning it because it's one of the best books I've ever read. It's a tiny gem, and it's by a, a Catholic monk named David Stentelroft. It's called the Music, Music of Silence, and what it does is it takes you through the hours and what it means. It's a simple, beautiful gem, one of the best books I've ever ever read. And I've given it to so many people. He gave it to Roger, who absolutely adored it. Um, and it comes from a slightly different group, but he explains all of this. It's Beautifully eloquently, the music of silence. Music of silence. David yeah. Stendhal Raft, R A F T. I think he's Franciscan. Wow, that's beautiful. I, 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 I so, we get to Cranmer morning and evening prayer. In our book, in our 1979 book, we drop in noonday prayer at Copland. Uh, there are a lot of people from Copland at bedtime. There are a lot of people from That's a very, very important service. Uh, whether gathered together or in bed, just before you're ready to turn out the light. And then New Day Prayer. Those are the two of the more cathedral offices that are very short and very sweet and very repetitive. Whereas morning and evening prayer are always changing. Like so, without going into a lot of the mechanics of it, just a few thoughts about daily office as it, as it comes into the 1979 book. Um, we talked about Jeff Lee, who is the bishop of Milwaukee. I've quoted him a couple times. His, his quote about the daily office is, if the heart of the Book of Common Prayer is the celebration of the Paschal mystery, of the Passover that Christ has created for us in dying and rising again, if the heart of the Book of Common Prayer is the celebration of the Paschal mystery in baptism and Eucharist, then the soul of the Book of Common Prayer may be in the daily office. Baptism and Eucharist give and renew Christian identity the daily office lives it out and shapes it. This idea that by pausing to pray one, two, three, four times a day to read scripture is to sort of dwell in God's presence is helping to shape it. And it goes all the way back to where we started this course. The way we pray forms the way that we believe. And, and so praying those, those offices again with other people time and time again can really begin to, to shape you. Uh, whereas another office that is the daily office is devotion as the constant daily practice and faith, the devotion in a fancy word, so the private portion, as the, as the constant practice of their faith. So the, the basic elements of the office uh, are in-course readings of scripture. We, we start, we just recently started at Hosea 1. We made a lot of skips because the, the, the parts get rather repetitive, but we worked our way through Hosea. And then this morning we started with Micah, right? So we, we kind of read books all the way through the Old Testament we cycle through every two years. The New Testament we cycle through every every one year, um, and we we recite the, the Psalms. Uh, two options for doing it: you can you can say the whole you can say uh, the whole Psalter on a monthly rotation, or there's a which I choose uh, I don't choose to do, or there's a sort of a seven week rotation. So the Psalms are a little bit more key to the key to the readings. Um, Morning and evening prayer tend to be more the monastic tradition. While they're not going to Sunday school eight times a day, they, they are, as I said, heavy on the Psalms and, and the scriptures. You can really dwell in the Word. Some of you may have heard that, but you can really dwell in the Word of God. And what I I love doing the daily office as a group, but I also love doing it like because you can pause. If a phrase in scripture catches your imagination, um, if uh, a verse in the Psalms, you go, well, I know I've read this 14 times before, if not 400 times before, but I've never heard that before. Let me just pause and think. Uh, you can't do these things when you're in church, right? But when you're by yourself, you can, you can just stop uh, and pray on that for a while and then move on. 
Uh, so one criticism, uh, and I think it, it's, a, it's a fair criticism, and it's probably also a little bit of a weak criticism, but one criticism of the recovery of the Holy Eucharist as the primary service on Sunday um, through the liturgical movement is that we've lost the, a lot of the tradition of the daily office. We said before that the Anglican norm on Sundays was morning prayer, uh, morning prayer with a sermon, maybe morning prayer with a sermon and a litany, maybe morning prayer with a sermon and a litany and a little, you know, the first part of the liturgy of the word of the people. Uh, but in, in instructing, as they do um, on page 13 of this book, it's saying that Eucharist is the primary worship of the people of God on the feast of the Lord on the Sundays. Uh, we have kind of lost the daily office tradition. So let me just end. Uh, oh, and, and one thing I should point out, uh, and you'll see it tomorrow if you come, and frankly every Wednesday in the month of October, uh, the other beauty of the daily office is because it doesn't require any clergy. It can always be led by the people. Uh, so Meryl, I, I'm gone every Wednesday in October for one reason. Another, so Meryl will be reading, reading evening prayer uh, every Wednesday in October because that's what the people uh, are, are allowed to do and encouraged to do. And it, again, it goes back to our very, some of our most ancient roots uh, uh, as Anglicans. So I'll just end this little bit, and hopefully I've whetted your appetite a little bit. I'm always happy to talk about the daily office, but a couple different spiritual dimensions as the, uh, of, of the daily office, if you do it fairly regularly. Uh, one commentator, this is a little funny, but, but I think it's true. One commentator talks about the daily office as a scripture delivery system. Uh, so with the lectionary, and it's back in the back of the book, for every for every day of the year, it tells you what the, what the, what the readings are, what the Psalters are, and all what the Psalter is. Um, it's a way to be guided through Scripture, again, leaving out a lot of the begats, 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 and all that stuff that you don't really get a whole lot, a lot of the dietary laws and things like that. All that stuff is excised. So what you're getting is sort of the core uh, beautiful parts of Scripture, and you just sort of dwell in them reflect on them and swim in them. Um, during the course of the year, we read all of Mark and Matthew. 96% of Luke, we omit the Christmas story and his boyhood, but we get that in the Sundays. And 91% of John. You read all of the Acts of the Apostles, all of Hebrews, all of Revelation, and 97% of all of the letters of Paul and the, and the general epistles, the other epistles of the book. And we read about 50% of the Old Testament. There's a lot more cutting there. Uh, about 25% in the first year and 25% in the second year of this two-year cycle. So, a couple, a couple last uh, reflections from other commentators. This is daily office as regular, unmediated, you can do it yourself, voluntary, do it at whatever time you want to worship. It is, it is self-guided, self-sought, and self actualized worship of God. Uh, and I think there's something just so powerful of, of, about that, that again, without taking sides in the Reformation, says the people of God are empowered to worship on their own. Uh, they, don't, they don't need the mediation of clergy. Uh, 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 an American Eastern Orthodox scholar writes about the daily office as being part of the heavenly liturgy, the office as being the worship of Christ and image that this is what Jesus, when they're not eating at the table, uh, they're, they're kind of engaged in this, this never-ending reading of, of prayer and scripture. And also the idea of, of opus, the, uh, opus, the Latin word for work, is, is the derivation of the word office for us. And this idea that you undertake the work of God, you undertake it voluntarily and you're lenient with yourself as the day is gone completely and you don't have time to do it, you don't do it, we don't fret over that. It's not a sin. But the idea that you sign yourself up between you and God to sort of do these, to do these uh, sessions of scripture and prayer on, on a regular basis. Uh, someone called it a divine enough. You know, that you, it, just, it just happens and it becomes part of the rhythm of, of your life. And then finally, if you're reading the, the gun and show book, uh, there's their sort of take on the daily office. It's the great gift of the rhythm. And I'll, I'll sort of end there to say that um, 
what I have found personally in, in seeing the daily office, I do more than you do prayer every day, new day prayer as often as I can, not that I'm not wild about it. Um, but it's doing it every day, it really does pulse, continue, amplify what we experience on Sunday morning throughout the other six days of the week. And so you can almost sense that, you know, as you, as you come down from the mountain of Eucharist on Sunday, and you sort of continue the echo of it through about Wednesday. And on Wednesday, there's a turn, and you're getting ready to go back to Eucharist on Sunday. These, these cycles, these contacts, these reflections are sort of keeping you, you know, in a never-ending stream of that grace that we, that we experience on the mountaintop on Sunday. So that's the world's shortest uh, uh, and probably least, a uh, uh, very partial <laughs> introduction to the Daily Office. I'm a big fan. I have. Buddhist professor in, in, in uh, seminary who thought, thought it was worthless. Uh, he never wanted to talk about it. Uh, and I never really understood why he was one of my favorite professors, but he was like, it's all the Eucharist. And I, I respectfully disagree. I think that marrying these two things together, if you can, uh, is, is, is real beauty. And it's really something in the academic tradition. I don't think, I stand to be corrected, but in the Catholic tradition, I don't think the divine office is something that most lay people. No, no, it's not no. lay people at all. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Every priest had to do it every day on his own. If he was a parish priest, for instance. Which is still true in the Church of England. It's not part of our vows in this church, but it is still true. It's a priest in the Church of England. You vow to do this every day. Good. All right. So, any questions? Sorry, that was it. Perfect. So, next time we will wrap up the formal part of the course. Uh, let me ask. We'll wrap up the formal part of the course. We'll look at the liturgical calendar. I debated doing this earlier, but uh, I don't know if there's any right or wrong way of doing it. So on the back of your handouts, I gave you a couple things you can look at in the Book of Common Prayer. And then if you uh, would all like to take one, these are the... Is it you? No, these are, these are old. We're getting rid of the old ones. The new ones haven't come yet. But these are the... These are the this is essentially the calendar of the church here. Let's get a bunch of pieces. Um, with, with all the big feasts and the little feasts marked out. Uh, and there's nothing special or magical about this. You don't have to memorize anything. But I just thought it might be helpful as we get ready to talk about the church's calendar. To look at it uh, and, and in a real, apply, day after day, month after month kind of way uh, to understand what we do. Uh, so we'll cover the liturgical calendar on November 1st. And then uh, I won't ask you now, but if either just after this class or send me. I kind of suggested there are there are other parts of this book that I'm happy to talk about. Uh, the catechism, uh, the historical documents in the back, some of the pastoral offices, whether it's burial or uh, confession or administration to the sick, uh, which some people call function. Uh, if there's any interest, even as a smaller group, of exploring some of the things, I'm happy to do that through the month of November. Or we could just end with the liturgical calendar. So just let me know your 